Hi, I'm Perry, and I'm standing in front of my 1985 Fidal VMC40 CNC machine. I want to tell you a story about a machine that was designed at the eve of the personal computer revolution and developing a brand new board for a machine that was built 38 years ago. Our story starts here, at the heart of the CNC machine. Here you have what's called the card cage. And within the card cage are all of the different boards which comprise the different underlying functions of the CNC machine. They're like the nervous system, the brain, the spinal column. And if we wanted to put those human anatomy terms into relation, this right here, this would be your spinal column. This is called the motherboard. This is where all the signals traverse throughout the machine and the way it's able to talk to each other. This particular design is called an S100 bus, and that has 100 connections. This was designed in an era when computers didn't fit in your pocket. Computers sat on a table or in a rack, and disk drives were the size of microwaves. In this particular control, we have several cards that each control an axis. So spindle drive, the A axis, Z axis, Y axis, X axis. And then we have a number of other cards which interface with the person. So this is the video card. And then we have the brains, which this is the CPU card and its program. And then we have a clock card which actually generates all of the signals that coordinate everything. And then here we have the interface board which allows the CPU and other peripherals over here to talk to everything on this side. And ultimately right here we have the interface card which takes everything that you see right here, these cables, and communicates it back to the nervous system. In all of these cards right here were designed in the late 70s and early 80s. And the S100 bus was actually designed uh, for the Altair 8080 computer. So this has a, a very old history. And I endeavored to build a new card that would work with this rather old technology. And this is that board. This is a memory expansion board for a Fidal CNC control, specifically the 1400-1 and the 1400-2 CPUs. This board allows you to store more or bigger programs in your CNC control so that you can have finer contouring and more elaborate designs and not need to stream the program from a computer. This one board replaces three separate boards, two different SKUs, and it costs about one-fifth of what it would cost you to, to put original Fidal boards in the machine. This is an original Fidal 1460-0 memory expansion board. This board gives you 128 kilobytes, not gigabytes, kilobytes, of memory and it expands a 1400-1 machine to a total of about 156 actual kilobytes of storage. I don't know how that actually translates into program storage uh, because there's a little lack of clarity with the Fidel marketing. This board has 16 individual 8 kilobyte memory chips, a battery backup, and all of this logic right here which addresses the memory. Now I reverse engineered this board in 2023 and developed a schematic which you can see here. I have posted this schematic on the internet on my github site and it contains everything that you could want to know about the design of this board. Now some of the unique features of this board, which go back to legacy S100 technology, is you know, obviously 
the 100 signal bus. This is a 1 8th pitch instead of the usual uh, 100 thousandths pitch. It has two Intel uh, dual bidirectional uh, bus drivers. Uh, it has two 74LS138 uh, decoders, uh, one for each bank. The way these are divided up is this set of eight chips right here is one bank, and this set of eight chips is the second bank. Now, all of that is fed back through three line drivers for the address bus. Uh, this logic right here is for brownout detection, uh, so when to switch over uh, or when to enable the memory uh, when the main power comes up. And then this right here is what feeds power from the main bus to the memory uh, when the control is turned on. So this is battery backed up, and this battery is keeping the contents of this memory alive uh, for the entire time that the machine is turned off. Uh, these batteries can last quite a long time. This board uh, probably costs somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, maybe $200, $250 to produce. Maybe more back in, uh, let's see, 1982. Uh, the memory chips would have been the most expensive part, so uh, these are RCA 6264315. Uh, I don't see an obvious date code on those, but this is a date code of 1984. This machine was 1985. I bought this off of eBay, so. Uh, this is about the same vintage as the machine. Now this board right here is the Fidal 1400-1A CPU card. This is the brain, as you would consider it, of the CNC machine. Uh, right here is the central processor. Uh, here you have a total of 32 kilobytes of memory. And here is where all of the program is stored. Uh, three of the chips right here contain the actual CNC control software. Uh, and then these two chips, one of them contains the uh, monitor program that does diagnostics, and the other chip contains uh, lookup tables for uh, doing uh, trigonometry. So the other features, you have another battery backup here for the main memory. You have, uh, you know, obviously the central processor. You have an oscillator right here, which feeds the Intel 8284 clock chip. This system right here runs at uh, one third of 22.1184 uh, megahertz, which works out to about uh, 7.632 megahertz, if I recall correctly. And right here is a uh, four to 16 line uh, decoder chip. And this is what drives the individual memory segment selects. Uh, over here, you have those two Intel bus drivers, and you have uh, a few uh, 74 LS, one, uh, 244 uh, bus drivers, as well as a 374, uh, oh, uh, sorry, th yeah, 374, that is an octal D-type latch. Uh, these are used, or at least this one is used, because of the multiplexed uh, data and address bus on the 8088 processor. This uh, is interesting because the 8088 is the chip that IBM chose for the IBM PC. But the interesting part is, is that while this is an 8088, uh, this shares little with the IBM PC in architecture. The IBM PC has a lot of custom uh, chips that were designed by Intel specifically for uh, acceleration. So you have an interrupt controller, you have a DMA controller, you have a programmable interval timer. Uh, there's a keyboard uh, BIOS chip that actually, or keyboard microcontroller, which talks to the keyboard. Uh, so there's a, a lot of technology that traditional S100 bus computers didn't have. And the way that they implemented those features was on the bus. On an IBM PC, the original design, uh, it only had five slots. 
And so you only you would put your video card, your disc controller, uh, your serial controller, and any other peripherals on in one of those five slots. A typical S100 bus computer would have something like 10 slots or 18 slots. Um, and so there were a lot more slots to be able to add peripherals. So your uh, memory expansion would go in that bus. So you might have a CPU card with no memory or a little bit of memory. And uh, for the uh, serial controller, that would be another card. A disk controller would be another card. So all of the stuff that IBM designed into the main board with like interrupt controllers and DMA controllers, those would have been add-in cards where uh, a specific S100 computer may not have a guaranteed set of peripherals. So all the software was designed basically just to run with the CPU and a little bit of memory and uh, maybe a video card or very likely there would be a, a terminal card and you would have a, a terminal connected to it instead of a monitor. Uh, so uh, it was a, a very much simpler design and that's what makes this approachable and uh, easily reverse engineerable. This entire design right here is all off-the-shelf discrete logic and I was able to make a complete schematic of the entire design and learn what every single one of these signals do, at least to the best of my knowledge, well enough to design a memory card for uh, the control. Now let me introduce chapter two. This is a Fidal 1400-2 CPU card. This would be the uh, approximately third generation because there was a 1400-0 uh, for the VMC45. And this has considerably upgraded capabilities over the 1400-1. Uh, it may seem very similar, uh, but you will notice some differences. There's this add-on card which contains the system software and this add-on card has uh, four chips on it that are 64 kilobytes each so it has a hundred is a total of 256 uh, kilobytes of program software whereas the original 1400-1 uh, had only in the neighborhood of 96 kilobytes of program software so already this is much more sophisticated and that sophistication also comes with additional memory. The original 1400-1 had 32 kilobytes of memory. Each one of these chips is 32 kilobytes for a total of 192 kilobytes. So what this board encompassed is the original memory that was on the 1400-1 plus the memory that was on the 1460-0. So this basically was a CPU and memory expansion in one. Uh, it also has uh, battery backup and it has uh, what they introduced a super capacitor. And what a super capacitor is, is it's sort of like a battery, but it only holds a charge for a very short period of time. So this super capacitor is there to retain the contents of the memory for about three days. So the battery, if, if you have a CNC machine that you use on a daily basis, the battery almost never gets used, except maybe over a long weekend or you know a, a downtime. Uh, so the super capacitor keeps the contents of the memory. Again, we have an 8088 processor, again, running at the same 7.6 some odd megahertz, but what we do see that's new about this design is they've started introducing custom logic chips. So what you have right here is a PAL or uh, programmable array logic. This allows you to take a bunch of those little chips like these and put them into a single chip. Uh, it makes it quicker to design. Uh, the chip itself is actually faster. Uh, but it also allows them to uh, combine a lot of the technology into that chip and hide it. So somebody can't simply look at the board and reverse engineer it and make a schematic and then make a replica of it. Some of the other things that are kind of notable is that there's two programmable read-only memories that are on this board right here. Uh, the significance of these, I don't know, but... Uh, the part number on them, what is significant is they're designed in such a way that they can act like logic chips. So you program a matrix 
of lookup values into the prom. And when you put data in one side, you get a pre-programmed pattern on the output side. And that output pattern allows you to emulate a bunch of different logic chips very simply with just pre-programmed logic. So once I purchased the 1400-2, and, and uh, the reason for that was actually uh, continuous contouring. In my first video, or my Fidal First Chips video, I noticed that as it was cutting parts out, it was pausing for about half a second where it was linking operations together. So if you were cutting this part out, you would you know, come to the edge and then it would kind of pause for a second or half a second and then it'd pause and then it'd come over here. And at the beginning of the radius, it would pause and at the end of the radius, it would pause. So it was pretty clear that the 1400-1 control did not have look ahead. So I asked David DeCosson of uh, NX Gen CNC parts what the most economical way of getting continuous contouring and he said 1400-2 control, which is what I bought. So I got the 1400-2 and I had this 1460-0 and I went and consulted my schematic of the uh, previous board I had and I rewired the, the little uh, jumper block right here to add memory to it. And then I was told the next day uh, by David that these are not designed to work with the 1400-2. I couldn't see a technical reason why this wouldn't work, and in fact, it did work. But that intrigued me, and so I went to eBay, and I looked up what a 1460-1 memory board looked like. And I'll insert a picture here, but the 1460-1 has just four memory chips, which are the same as the four, the same capacity as the memory chips on the 1400-2, so they're 32 kilobytes each, and it seemed kind of like a waste that you had a board with just four chips and then uh, you know two 74 LS244 drivers to replace the Intel 8216, and then there was a CD4066 about right here, and then a single PAL chip, and that single PAL chip does all of this and you just had your little jumper block that goes to the PAL chip, and there was a lot of real estate that was unused. And I got to thinking, well, you know, today you can go to DigiKey or any supplier, and for about six bucks, you can buy a 512 kilobyte memory chip. So I went there and I bought a two before of these, and I started doing the reverse engineering on the 1460-0, and I designed this board, which is the 1460-1E. And what makes it unique is that this board replaces the two SKUs, the 1460-1 and the 1460-0. Uh, but it's an E revision because of eformance engineering. And with one jumper block here, it works in either control. So when you're using a 1400-2, you put all of the jumper positions up, and when you're using a 1400-1, you put them all down. And this one board gives you the maximum amount of memory that you can uh, achieve on the older controls. And that happens to be uh, acclaimed 422 kilobytes of program storage. I think it's a little bit less than that based on the memory test, but that's the official uh, word. So single chip right here, 512 kilobytes, replaces uh, about 64, if you had, you know, you counted four boards, 64 individual chips. So it's relatively simple. Uh, I kind of followed the pattern that Fidal did, which is uh, 74 LS244 bus drivers, uh, some decode logic, uh, some more bus drivers here. Now they're uh, 1460-1 does not have these bus drivers that appear on the 1460-0. And what these are doing is uh, they're isolating the address bus here from the chip here. Uh, and I think the original reason they did that was brownout protection. Uh, so they had on here, uh, this chip right here, 
uh, comprises a, a brownout protection. It, it disables the write enable on the memory chips until uh, the voltage comes up to a, a certain level. And that voltage is provided by these transistors. Uh, I did the same thing here with a supervisor uh, circuit. One, one chip solution or one, one unit solution. Uh, you still have your uh, pull down resistors so that uh, all of the address uh, lines are pulled to ground whenever there's no power to the board. Uh, that ensures that the chip is consuming the least amount of power. At least that's a theory. But it also protects it so that when main power doesn't, hasn't come up, uh, it is isolated, but then also uh, this enable is tied into these uh, address buffers here. So these address buffers do what's something called tri-state, which means the output is neither high nor low, it's just at a, you know, uh, sort of ethereal level. And that disconnects the address bus from the memory chip until the power on this bus comes up to full level. And the uh, same thing happens with the uh, data drivers, uh, well, to a degree. So basically, uh, you know, taking a lot of cues from the original design, but this is all original uh, design here, and uh, it actually works. It gives me a full 422 kilobytes of program storage, and it was something that I designed and built from scratch. I wanted to share with you a couple of other boards I designed to go along with the memory board. Now this is what I call the Fidal test harness board. As you can see, there's a S100 bus connector here, 100 positions, and a Raspberry Pi Pico, as well as a BOD resistor. This board right here is designed to be able to talk to a Fidal board uh, specifically memory boards, but it would also talk to something like the video card. Uh, this board is actually designed uh, to take two different types of microcontrollers. So here we have the Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, which is about $4. And then here there's a slot for the uh, propeller, uh, Parallax Propeller 2 Edge Module. And the primary advantage of the Edge Module is that A, it's faster, B, it's got more cores, and C, it has more pins. So the additional pins are brought out here with the intent that uh, you can hook on to these pins here and then route additional signals. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, talk to other peripherals, like say uh, maybe the CPU card or something like that, emulate uh, the keyboard or whatnot. So this uh, is designed so I can write code on the Raspberry Pi Pico to exercise uh, capabilities and, and do memory testing. Now, the way this board is designed is you have 3.3 uh, volt logic stuff here and on this side here, it's all 3.3 volts to this side using a, a normal ATX power supply. And then over here, you've got sort of your you know, five volt stuff. Uh, where that sort of bifurcation line is, is right here uh, along this. So these are 74 LVC245 chips. And the LVC series is specifically designed to be uh, 5 volt tolerant so you can interface with 5 volt logic. So these run at 3.3 volts, but the bus is powered by 5 volts. So when something on the bus talks to this, these are tolerant to the over voltage, as it were. But they also generate a high enough voltage to be able to talk to the 5 volts uh, logic that's in, you know, in the bus here. So these are all sort of isolation uh, chips, uh, the 74 LVC245. And then right here, these are actually uh, 74 uh, HC373s, which are uh, transparent octal latches. Uh, there's only, what, 26 GPIOs on a, a Raspberry Pi Pico, and certainly not enough for this. Uh, so what I did is I multiplexed it. There's a, a common data bus that goes to all of these. Uh, or all three of these address bus latches. And the way it works is you write your address component, so this is 24 bits, you write each 8-bit uh, segment uh, to one of these latches, then latch it, write to this one, latch it, write to this one, latch it. And then uh, there's a, an enable that allows you to sort of enable the whole shebang. Because when these turn on, these are just 
you know, in tri-state. So they're not either loading or providing power to the bus. They, they're basically isolated. And then right here, this is part of the logic for the uh, read-write bus for data. So you've got your separate data bus goes to the, the Pi uh, Pico, and then you've got your address bus multiplexed. Now, the Fidal is kind of interesting. Uh, going back to the PC uh, era, uh, the 8088 has 20 address bits. And the way that it works is that it, it has sort of uh, 16 native address lines for uh, like a 16-bit uh, memory, uh, like your 8-bit your computer, but then it has segment addresses. And you can, there's a, segment addresses are also 16-bit, but the way it's effectively used is they're actually only 4 bits. Uh, so you, you take it and you, you know, shift it uh, right by 4 bits and then tack on your, your address and that's your 20-bit address. Your, so what Fidal did, though, is they actually take those upper four bits and they break them out into 16 different lines. And the original 1400-0 actually does implement that. All 16 of the address lines or segment uh, selects are broken out uh, to the bus. The 1400-2 doesn't do that because some of the peripheral or, or specifically address space is on the card. Like where I said, you're combining the 1400-1 uh, CPU card with its 32k of memory with the you know 128k from the 1460-0 uh, memory uh, expansion and you marry those together. Well, it doesn't have the address lines that would talk to that 1460-0 uh, exposed on the card edge. So they break it out uh, in for every peripheral they talk to on the bus. This is how they select it. So. Uh, the, like say the memory card uh, is in the F segment, so then your F line is, you know, enabled, and your 1460-0 memory expansion would be, you know, on the 7 and the 8 line, so those get activated separately. And then, you know, my uh, memory card emulates, uh, you know, several of the later memory cards as well as the early ones, so it actually exposes 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, and E. So all of those segments are actually routed uh, to that single card. And uh, the reason for the, the little switch is that the 1400-2 doesn't have the 7 and 8 routed there, which means that uh, the input signals that come from the, the chip on the board are not present. And so they're what they call floating, you know, ethereal. They're not connected to anything. And that's bad. You don't want a design where you have an indeterminate state. So those are just connected to the you know five volt rail through a hundred ohm resistor. Uh, I picked that because if somebody accidentally put it into a 1400-1 you know system and had those uh, turned on, it wouldn't fry it immediately, but it wouldn't work. Um, so anyway, this is the test harness board uh, that's designed to work with the Fidal. And I have one other board that is sort of designed to test the test harness. And I'll show you that. Now this is the test harness test board, which is funny because it's really just uh, one of the memory expansion boards, but it doesn't have memory on it. And in the place of memory, what it does have is some LED bar graphs. And these LED bar graphs show me the state of the uh, address lines, data lines, uh, the enables, and then the uh, selects as well as a power good. So uh, there's a power good that comes on uh, that's blue, and then the rest of them are just there to uh, actually give me this, this status. It's also missing the jumper block here because I just wired uh, these signals uh, so that it's like it's a 1400-2, and there's no uh, driver here because I just want this to be able to listen to what's happening on the bus. I don't want it to uh, be able to, you know, poke at the bus. So everything here is is sort of read only, and what that means is I can actually plug this into the motherboard on the Fidal and watch the blinking lights, which I think is pretty cool. I might get a little snippet of that. Here's a preview of the blinking lights, which are not currently blinking because there's no activity, but 
this is what the idle state of the bus looks like with everything disconnected and you know like i said in the tri state what you get is actually a pull up effect because all of the 74 ls series logic actually has a, a bias resistor on the input which pulls it up uh, to the uh, voltage supply rail so that's why all of the leds are on right now and the reason why the three little leds for enables are not on is that those are pulled high and they're enable low so they're not on because they're it's high instead of low and the same uh, is true for the data bus the data bus uh, the way that it's set up unless one of the segments is selected it will not enable the data bus well i hope you enjoyed this video and my look into the Fidal uh, CPU and control architecture, as well as the design of my own Fidal memory expansion board. If you have any questions or you're interested in testing or would like one of these memory expansion boards, you can get in touch me, with me through YouTube or just leave a comment in the video and I can reach out to you. Thanks.